Welcome back to The Extract. I'm Kyle Meyer, and next to me is a return film E. Um, you know, I think this is the first time we've had someone in the chair a second time. Uh, really? Yeah, yeah. No, so this is this is uh, this is quite the honor for us. We did not expect this, so this is very cool. Uh, everyone, welcome back, Olivier Humbrecht, or Humbrecht. How do you like to say it? Humbrecht. Yeah, Humbrecht. So the uh, you know Olivier here was last time and uh, talking with Tris and uh, we we covered a lot of uh, biodynamics and kind of like the background of the winery and such uh, last time Olivier was here. But you know going through the range of wines today, uh, it was pretty cool for us to to talk about. You know we, we were noticing the different soil types <clears throat> as well as we want to talk a little bit about today about uh, Olivier's insane commitment to quality, uh, which I think is is very welcome. To me personally, this is me talking, not you, but in an area that has not necessarily been known outside for a few certain producers to this type of commitment to quality. So uh, welcome back, Olivier. And uh, I, wanna, I wanted to just start getting into the wines straight away. The, um, uh, these are all from 2014, right? It's a small selection of 14, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Mm. And I noticed <clears throat> for some of you that may be uh, older times in Humbrecht fans, uh, there's a kind of a newish label on the table, this Calcare series. Yes, we started uh, six, seven years ago. Yeah, man. with the 2006 vintage. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. The, the the story behind the label is that uh, in 2006 we uh, declassified a few vineyards. It was a complicated vintage, and I had two casks of Pinot Gris side by side, and one was coming from the valley floor, and the other was co coming from the hillside, which is uh, limestone-based rocks. And to distinguish the two of them, because I'm not very good at giving, you know, uh, fantasy names to wines, <laughs> we called it one grave, which means you know, gravelly soil, mm -hmm. and the one uh, calcare. Yeah. And the name of calcare just left because we didn't give the name grave to the other Pinot Gris because grave in French also means serious. You know? Right. Yeah. Right. So that would have been a bad name <laughs> for the wine. Qu'est-ce que c'est dégueulasse? But that's how we started to make the, the wine uh, called uh, limestone, calcare. Yeah. Right. And so this is, uh, so basically you have a series of vineyards. I guess the way Alsace is set up, right, with the, with the gravelly vineyards are kind of on the valley floor to a certain they, that's extent. That's where they are, yes. And the limestone or calcare vineyards are on the hillsides. And, and what would constitute most of what we would consider maybe like the Grand Cru type vineyards, right? Yeah, well, the, the limestone series are all mostly on the foothills of the Vosges Mountains. Okay. And uh, it represents roughly 50% of our hillside vineyards. The other half is more like Vosges material, mm -hmm. which is granite, sandstone, volcanic, slate, and all these kind of things. Yeah. Right, right. Yeah. So, so for this wine, uh, you incorporate, is, is it like a younger vine selection, or, or what are the, what's the thought process behind the calcare? We, we, uh, all our limestone vineyards are on hillsides, and by definition, are potential uh, single vineyard uh, uh, quality, or mm -hmm. crew uh, uh, quality. And uh, the idea behind this wine is to be able to make the single vineyard uh, as it should be, which means that sometimes you have to declassify some grapes because the vines are a bit too young or you're not happy with a bit too much production or you're not happy with something, that vintage or something like mm -hmm. that. Mm -hmm. So it's, 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 it's a concept of the second vin, mm -hmm. the second wine, if you want, yeah. you know, in, in Bordeaux, for example. Yeah, yeah, you know. yeah. From these sites, but with the uh, younger vines. In, in this case, when, when we're talking about the Pinot Gris, uh, the vineyards here are, are some of your top sites, right? Yes, and w when I say younger vine, it doesn't just mean the kind of a young vine, like three, four, five years old. For me, uh, a vine is uh, uh, capable to really explore uh, the area, the place, mm -hmm. the terroir, when it kind of hits 25, 30, 35 years old. Right. So this. Calcare range is made from vineyards that usually range between you know, 5, 10 years old to about uh, 20, 30 uh, years old. Yeah. So 20, 30 years old are Younger young vines. Yeah, well, it's like people, you know. Yeah, right? <laughs> you know, I was going to ask you, vines, huh? cause, you, know, I, you know, I've asked a few producers before about the difference with old vines and, 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 and young vines. And, and when does a vine make the, the, the uh, you know, when it, when it blossoms into yeah. an old vine? Say, what happened to your face? Oh, this? Cut myself shaving. Yeah. Maybe I'll start shaving soon. Yeah. And you know, some and I get a range of answers based on the type of grape variety and the location, etc. In Alsace, it feels to you around that 25, 30 year old mark, you start getting into a, a different level of I'm, concentration. I, well, and complexity. I'm not saying a vine becomes an old vine that's 30 years old. Yeah. 
uh, is just a, a, an average age where the soil exploration is uh, sufficient, especially if you have like uh, three, four feet of uh, you know topsoil marl yeah. or something like that. Yeah, the kind of time it takes for the vine to really reach and explore properly the mother rock uh, to get a more consistent um, uh, production year after year, you see mm -hmm. much less, you know, uh, variations in, in crop size. And also you, it's about that age where the vigor of the vine starts to become uh, uh, more settled. You right. get less excessive uh, production that you often see in a vine, which is, you know, 8, 10, 15 years old. The whole impetuous youth thing where, yeah. Exactly, yeah. Yeah, yeah. 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 Wow, this is... Oof. <laughs> so, like you said, this comes from mostly three vineyards in our uh, range, um, uh, mostly uh, Claude Vinsbill in Hunavir, mm -hmm. and exceptionally in 14, uh, Claude Jepsel yeah. in Turkheim, which is more of a gypsum type of uh, limestone, and a little bit of a uh, Heimbrook also mm -hmm. uh, in it. Yeah. Is it. You know, getting back to the whole village thing, you mentioned a couple different villages. You know, yeah. a lot of Alsatian producers are kind of village-centric. You know, they focus on one area, but mm -hmm. was that your father? working through and purchasing top sites in all these different villages? Uh, yeah, he, he was kind of almost forced to uh, understand the concept because uh, he's from Geberschwe, that's a small village about uh, 10 miles south of Colmar. Mm -hmm. And when he married my mother, Geneviève Vind, she was from Vindenheim, Turkheim area. Okay. So when the two little estates came together, all of a sudden he was able to compare two very different uh, areas. You know. It's like if you're in Burgundy, for example, you would you put side by side uh, Volnay and uh, something like Volne Romane, you know? Right, right. Very, very different in, in character. Yeah. And that's the case between Geberschwer and where you find the Goldet uh, Muska, for example, and the vineyard of um, uh, Vinzenheim Turkheim, where you find uh, mostly like the Plodje uh, mm. uh, uh vineyard. Um, that opened probably uh, a certain perspective. Being able to see that you know a growth or a riesling planted there and there give a completely different uh, uh, type of wine. Yeah. Some areas being better for some uh, grapes more than others, and automatically that developed a certain curiosity that made me want to explore more. Yeah, and uh, yeah, and that was the beginning of the story. Yeah. And the rest was history. The um, you know, so now next to us we have a, a certified Grand Cru site. Yeah, this is big time, serious dirt here. Yeah. Now it's riesling. <laughs> Okay, it's Riesling, but you're allowed to make all four different grape varieties from this vineyard and call them Grand Cru if you wanted. Exactly. Technically, right? Yes. So someone could grow Muscat in the Rangen and say, this is Grand Cru. There is some, actually. There is some. Yeah. Okay. Not from us, but from another producer. But from another producer. Yeah. You know, this, I mean, it, it's, it's, it's from, from, from my standpoint, it, it's, it's hard to believe that every vineyard can produce four varieties of a Grand Cru quality. Yeah. Well, it's a... Uh, to cut long story very short, yeah. um, initially, uh, when you look at the past, uh, every vineyard probably had uh, one or two wine that was probably uh, expressing the most, the, the, the potential of quality of uh, uh, every vineyard. Yeah. Uh, because in, uh, when the Grand Cru was um, established and classified in Alsace, they, they put the same rules for every single Grand Cru, which probably was a mistake that was only corrected in 2011 allowing each Grand Cru to specifically write their own rules of production. Uh, so it means that in the 80s, uh, uh, since Muscat, Gebrechtschmier, Riesling, and Pinot Gris, all four have, and even some other grapes like Pinot Noir and Silvaner, you know, yeah. have the potential to express the quality of a Grand Cru, uh, it was allowed everywhere. Yeah. And Unfortunately, some wine growers uh, decided to use this uh, potential to make all the type of wine they could, instead of just uh, keeping what was historically good in that specific, in that specific site. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Mm. And unfortunately, some grapes also got sometimes uh, eliminated, and because yeah. so-called they are less quality, but that's not <laughs> always true. You know, it's it's not the grape variety that makes a vineyard great; it's the vineyard itself. Right. You know? Its right. location, the soil. The terroir or whatever, yeah. The taste it can give to the wine and all that. Right, that's right. That's important. Yeah. Hmm. But Rangen's a Riesling site. Well, it's also primarily. A we also make it's, 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 it, it's primarily. This is one of those vineyards that does a lot Riesling. of things well, right? Yes. I mean, <laughs> there are some vineyards that, for me, there is no, you know, uh, decision. It's yeah. that, that grape and that style of wine. Yeah. Point. You know, that brand, for example, for me, is Riesling. Riesling. Yeah. And uh, that's it. There's no discussion for that for me. 
even though some of the people would argue, you know, Pinagree, Gibbers, whatever, the rhyme is a bit more complicated. Um, uh, it's by definition and by heart a Riesling vineyard. You know, uh, volcanic rocks can be kind of compared with slate. You know, poor, rocky, uh, uh, low in organic matter, cracked, the roots can go deep. It's a very warm soil in a cool climate, so it's, it's, it shouts Riesling. Yeah. And especially that kind of volcanic rock can give that, you know, uh, salty, mineral, flinty character to the wine. Again, it shouts Riesling. Yeah. But a grape like Pinot Gris has uh, proven to express even more than some, sometimes the Riesling, that huge smoky uh, uh, potential uh, uh, of the vineyard and that huge saline uh, aftertaste. So to choose between the two would be a hard and tough call for me. You know? Right. So you get the opportunity to do both. Yes, yeah. absolutely. And as an example for, for the Grand Cru here, this, oh, this wine's wicked good. Um, yeah. the, what's, <laughs> what's, the, what's the vine age cut off here? So the folks at home have some idea when you make the selections. Well, it's very easy. They were all planted in the, the early 60s. And anything that we planted in uh, the 80s, because my father bought this vineyard in uh, 1977, mm -hmm. some vineyard had to be changed or some vineyard had to be planted because it was, you know, left abundant since the mm -hmm. uh, Second World War. So these these grapes are declassified into uh, a secondary label. Yeah. A bit like the calcare. Yeah. It's called volcanic. Yeah, okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Makes sense. Yeah. Okay. Now, because... Okay, we're, we're, we're multitasking here, okay? So bear with us. The Because um, we want to talk about Muscat. Or Muscat. Thank you. Because uh, Muscat's kind of... To me, it gets kind of a little left out when we talk about the Grand Cruz of Alsace. You know what I mean? It's almost like, oh, Muscat. Uh, I get that in the tasting room in Temecula. You know, it's, <laughs> you, you know what I'm saying? Like, it's, yeah. um, it often gets a little left out. But when it does this, so, so quick question here. What does it take for Muscat to do this? Is, I mean, you know what I mean? Like, this is one of the greatest Muscat wines in the world. Yeah. Uh, first, there are many, many cultivars of Muscat. So the, for me, the, the one with the highest potential and quality in Alsace is the Muscat d'Alsace, which is the Petit Grand Muscat. Petit Grand, okay. That's the same grape you find in uh, the Roussillon area in mm -hmm, France, mm -hmm. you know, that makes uh, Rive d'Alt and, mm -hmm, uh, and mm -hmm. all that. It takes also a soil that, just like for Gebrecht forces the grapes to ripen slowly. Mm. Uh, you want to keep acidity, you want to keep uh, structure, you want to um, uh, entrap the wine uh, into a less overly aromatic expression. So you want the grape to really ripen very, very slowly, you want the alcohol to build up very slowly, and you want to keep the acidity. It's the opposite of Riesling in a certain way. <laughs> okay. So yeah. by definition, the, 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 uh, the best kind of vineyard would be relatively deep, uh, rich soil, lots of marl and clay on a, on a pretty aggressive young uh, limestone base rock like the gold dirt. Yeah. That would give all that uh, grain uh, uh, texture mm -hmm. and acidity uh, to the wine and would force the grape to ripen much slower. Yeah. Yeah. Other way you end up with uh, an aperitif type. Right. Yeah, but so I was going to say, so, so it's almost about, you know, reining the grape in. Yes. So you yeah. don't have that expressive flowers and everything. Exactly. I want some bracelets and everything. Daddy, you better get the best for me. Yeah. Like you want it in there, mm. but you don't want it to be the main thing. Yeah. So that that's so the main work is doing is is almost asking less of the grape than more. I always say to make it understandable. Um, uh, and to take an image, Riesling is a grape variety that likes to have his feet in the heat and the head in the cold. Yeah. <laughs> Gewürztraminer and Muska is the opposite. Yeah. They want the feet in the cold mm -hmm. and the head in the warmth. Yeah, yeah. You know? This is exquisite. So is, you, so you could use like different varieties of Riesling maybe in Alsace and still make a Grand Cru quality wine, both the Muscat you need to focus really on this one particular variety of Muscat in the right spot. Well, the, you, you can by low plant also the Autunel, which is the other grape that mm -hmm. we use in, uh, in Alsace. But technically, uh, uh, if you're looking for structure, acidity, and longevity in the wine, because for me, the definition of a Grand Cru is not just expression of an area, a culture, a soil into a bottle of wine. It's also uh, a wine that has its, uh, the, the, the potential to age yeah. and develop complexity through time. Yeah. So we're uh, 
most people would think muska is something you have to drink as as as, as almost as it is released, no? Right, right. Uh, well, wine like that can keep for ages, decades. You know? Well, well, that's why I asked you earlier, and I was, I was like, I was like, so what do you, what do you think, Levy, of this wine? You know, half a dozen years? Blah, blah, blah. He's like, you're kidding, right? <laughs> <laughs> he was like, you're joking, right? Mm -hmm. You know, but the point is, there's very few muscats, dry muscats, that work at this level. Mm -hmm. So the whole, how long can it age? It's almost an unknown, based on the fact there's only maybe a handful of wines. There are now that's only maybe five, six Grand Cru that really have a, a, a specific capacity for producing Muscat. Mm. It's also a grape that genetically is a big bunches, you know. Yeah. So to to keep the yield down to a level where you can express the vineyard in the wine is hard work in the vineyard. Yeah. To lower down the vigor of the wine so it produces less clusters and smaller berries is really, really hard uh, uh, work. And it's one condition to be able to make a wine like that. That's why it's not produced in very, very large uh, numbers, you know. Yeah, yeah. Uh, production is sometimes above the criteria of the Grand Cru. You make too much wine, so you're not allowed to produce the Grand Cru. And secondly, uh, Muscat is completely misunderstood. Most of the time, from, you know, any countries, it's a sweet wine, yeah, fortified yeah. wine, a dolcetto wine, yeah, uh, yeah, something easy. sparkling sometimes, uh, <laughs> sweet. Uh, only really in Alsace, or sometimes also maybe in Germany, and pr probably also you could find a few bottles in Austria, but yeah. mostly in Alsace you'd find this type of uh, uh, wine. And I don't understand why it's not more successful, right. <laughs> because really it's it's totally perfect with most modern food yeah. you can get. Gorgeous, today, yeah? gorgeous, yeah. gorgeous, gorgeous. You know, it, it's um, maybe because, you know, the, the fruity style is the easy way out. If I, if I may say that, uh, if you like the Viognier type of uh, aromatics, yeah. but you don't like the alcohol and the lack of acidity and the yeah. weight of some Viognier wines, yeah. go for dry Muscat from Alsace. <laughs> all right, you guys get all this? This was crazy. I could sit here and do this all day, uh, but he has to go do other stuff, so we have to let him go. Olivia Humbricht, boom. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. That was awesome. Thank Again, you. and I'm glad we were able to talk a little more about the varieties in the vineyards today. And uh, so add this to the, uh, to, this is uh, parts three and four, I guess, of our uh, sit-downs with Olivia Humbrecht. Uh, thanks so much again for coming. You're welcome. All right, Thank cheers. You.